All right, fantastic. Well, let's get started because we've got uh, an hour, uh, which isn't a whole lot of time for such a great uh, topic uh, that we've got today. I wanted to start first uh, by welcoming uh, everyone uh, today, and I would like to show my uh, respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and we are all on various lands uh, today. I think we might have some international guests too. So I'm in Melbourne. Um, so those respects are to the Wurundjeri uh, peoples. Uh, to get everyone kind of warmed up, it'd be great to hear where are you based, uh, if what city you're in, what location, uh, so drop it into the chat. We are going to be using uh, that uh, to help us uh, as we go to have a bit of a two-way conversation today, so please uh, feel free to say hello and drop that in. Um, so what we are uh, here to really talk about today is uh, is ways of working journeys and how to, you know, kind of best enable those. And so over the past decade or so, I've seen, I've seen it all. I've seen journeys that have started off with any, without any support at all. So kind of at the grassroots level and teams, uh, you know, doing, uh, doing the right thing, delivering better outcomes, but then they inevitably bump into those enterprise blockers uh, that uh, get in the way. And I've seen the complete other end where it's been a capital T, uh, capital A um, agile transformation journey where um, the, the consultants and the coaches uh, roll in uh, and there's a lot of them. Um, and, um, you know, changes sometimes when it's capital T transformations are then pushed out onto organizations uh, and the inevitable uh, organ rejection often occurs. Uh, so those are kind of two extremes that I've seen. Uh, and so kind of what happens uh, often with that is, um, and I think what's happened over the last 10 years is Agile has become one of those dirty words. There's a handful of other dirty words that I've picked up uh, over the last number of years, but sometimes that's that's the result. Um, so I think there's another way or a better way. Um, and at Sooner Safer uh, Happier, what we talk about is in order to learn how to ski, you do need to have a ski instructor to help you on that journey. Otherwise you'll go down straight down the hill and you'll have the inevitable crash and break your leg. Um, but uh, in terms of facilitating that um, the ski lesson, there's a way to kind of think about and do that. And so the way that I've seen that happen uh, in a pattern uh, that I've seen work before is kind of somewhere in the middle of those two extremes that I um, kind of painted the picture of. So a bit of a hub and spoke model, um, you know, the ways of working center of enablement is a, it has, is practicing and role modeling a servant leadership. Um, it's removing those enterprise roadblocks, those impediments. Uh, it's role modeling that, but it's definitely giving the autonomy uh, to the teams and the areas of the business to, to kind of get on with it themselves. So that is what we are here to unpack a little bit more. So we'll explore that through the conversation. Um, and I'm here uh, to do that together with uh, a few panel uh, members. So let me introduce them uh, each to you. So uh, first up, um, because you're uh, spotlighted, there we go, thanks Mark, uh, is uh, Chris Chan. So Chris is an enterprise leader uh, and agile coach. Uh, he's worked with some of Australia's largest brands, including uh, ANZ, Telstra, NAB. He's been both a consultant and has had in-house uh, coach roles. Uh, and he's one of those people, uh, as Anne mentioned it to us before we got started, that it feels like he's just someone that everyone knows uh, because he's a, a long timer in the Agile community uh, here in Melbourne. So welcome, Chris. Thanks for joining us today. Next up, uh, we've got uh, Anne, uh, Anne Madden. Uh, so Anne is also an enterprise agile coach, uh, consultant and trainer. Uh, she's worked across some of the toughest uh, sectors in agility uh, and the toughest ones I mean, because they're asset intensive um, and so they're hard nuts to crack. Um, and so, uh, and you've also uh, been a consultant and have had in-house roles before. So welcome uh, to our conversation today, Anne. Thanks, Maria. Good to be here. Awesome. Uh, and it looks like uh, Chris might be having some uh, internet challenges. So we'll roll with that as we go. 
Uh, and Niall, uh, last but not least, welcome uh, to our panel. And Niall, you were also uh, an enterprise agile and uh, coach and consultant. That was a little bit of the prerequisite of being on this panel today, so no surprise. Uh, and you are the uh, founder and principal coach at uh, Source Agility, and that is a consultancy uh, that specializes in uh, designing and delivering agile coaching uh, as a service. Um, and you've recently launched the Accountable Agility System that basically helps ensure as ways of working COEs um, are responsible, uh, focus on performance, uh, and, and basically, you know, get stuff done. So welcome, Niall. Thanks, Mary. And I love your, uh, your virtual background. Awesome. <laughs> On brand. Uh, yeah. yeah, great. Um, all right. So that is uh, who we are, uh, the four of us. And now I would love to get to know who's in the who's in the room with us uh, today. Um, so in in Zoom spirit, we've got a poll uh, for for you to fill out, which I will launch now if everyone can just um humor me with filling that five simple questions out for me that would be awesome No worries, Chris. I think with the weather that we're having uh, here in Melbourne, any anything goes with Wi-Fi. So <laughs> glad it's working. All right. So we've got roughly about 80 of us that have uh, replied uh, back to the poll. So thank you for that. Um, and I can see, and I'll share the results just quickly. Um, and so I might, does anyone need a few more? I might open, keep it open for another five more seconds and then I'll close it just to give everyone a little bit longer to finish it up. All right, fantastic. So that's just roughly over 80% of us. So I might end it there because I think it's giving us a good a good view. Um, so basically what we've got uh, panel members uh, in the room today with us in terms of people whose organizations are on some sort of journey, um, over half of us um, are doing stuff across the enterprise. Hooray, that is awesome. <laughs> That is absolutely awesome uh, to hear and uh, the rest uh, in pockets. Um, so very few of us are not doing anything or not sure, which is fantastic. Um, second question, do you have a ways of working team? 68% of us have said yes, fantastic. Um, so maybe uh, this is then about how do we optimize uh, for that? So there'll be some tips and tricks and some patterns out of our conversation that might help with that. Um, and then for the 18% who have said no, maybe this is the uh, the business case uh, to, to kind of get that rolling. In terms of where the coaches, um, if coaches are involved, uh, so yes, 85%, fantastic. Uh, where are the coaches from? This is a bit of, it's a mix. Um, so you've got a mix of kind of firms, contractors, consultants. Um, but there's a, an interesting number there around 30, 29, 30% of, of permanent employees, which is great that this is now, you know, coaches are seen as a capability, a strategic capability that organizations are investing in. And then lastly, in terms of what outcomes do your coaches uh, support, we've got mindset 30%, which is great. And then better value, sooner, safer, happier. So I thought I was being cheeky by throwing that in there. Uh, but uh, but glad that it's 30% uh, of, of you are contributing and supporting towards that. And a little less on the process improvements than I would have expected, which that is a really nice thing to see. 
and 20% delivery improvements. I'm curious as to what the 6% other is, but maybe uh, for those of you who have chosen that one, uh, you can um, pop that into the chat, that would be great. So it looks as though team, we've got um, a really great group of people that are uh, willing and uh, open to uh, learning and sharing and uh, hearing about the conversation that we're about to have. So shall we crack into it? Are we ready Let's to roll? It. All right, awesome. And so I think Niles just dropped it into the chat, but uh, please, by all means, uh, we've got some questions uh, that we'll be asking, but if you wanna add your own insights, cause we've got a great group here, please drop them into the chat. The chat. Uh, Mark will be your, uh, Mark Payne uh, will be your voice uh, and we'll uh, bring those forward in the conversation that we're having. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, we'll address them as we go. Uh, and we've got a bit of time at the end. So rock and roll. So I think then the place to start is what is a ways of working center of enablement? And my language there is, is quite specific. It's not a center of excellence. It is a center of enablement. Um, and so I think, what is it that they do? Or Chris, did you want to uh, give us your take on that? Open it up for us. Yeah, I'm happy to have a go. Uh... I guess given I've been involved in multiple organizations, whether you call it a center of enablement, um, center of excellence, uh, community of practice, um, a change uh, team, whatever you want to call it. We used to have an agile change team was the name. Um, I guess it's a team of uh, practitioners helping the organization with the change. Um, and I guess bringing in the skill sets around uh, ways of working. Um, the outcome isn't necessarily implementation of the practices or tools, but I guess it's a, it's a means to it. So I guess uh, I'm involved in a team now around 20 coaches or internal, uh, bringing different skill sets and backgrounds, uh, all coming from very similar, um, you know, if you look at uh, Michael Spade and um, Lisa Atkins, you know, the X-Wing model, um, you know, bring different elements of business transformation to tech, you know, we've got some DevOps um, uh, coaches, we've got uh, some who are really have um, very little agile background, but really strong in coaching, uh, leadership and uh, coaching in particular. And so bringing that to the forefront around organizational change. Yeah, awesome, Chris. So you're so the things that I picked up there, even just in terms of who you've got on the team, it sounds like delivery, so DevOps, so technical delivery and focus, leadership and and change as well. So are there um, to maybe unpack it a little bit more in terms of how you're helping the organization to change, in what things are you guys focused on? Um, yeah. How, how it yeah, I guess it comes down to um, objectives and the outcomes of the change. And so when we embarked on the journey, uh, there was three key pillars uh, or three objectives. One was improve customer engagement um, uh, through speed to value um, of delivery. Uh, the other one is uh, employee engagement, improve employee engagement and uh, talent and attraction and simplification. They're the three main objectives. And so all our work aligns towards those kind of objectives. Yeah, so it's very much then aligned to the organizational uh, outcomes, it sounds like then is what your yeah. coaches are. Yeah, yeah that's know. correct. And, and, and how that is implemented and I guess what you focus on is based on the context of the business and the areas. Um, so I guess it's no cookie cutter. Each area might focus on different areas. Um, so one could, for example, employee engagement, um, there's a, a, a portfolio going through psychological safety. So improving how does people show up and create psychological safety. Now that would impact employee engagement. Um, a few years ago, we focused on delivery predictability. How do teams uh, become more predictable in delivery through better planning, prioritization, visibility of metrics, et cetera. Yep, so, sounds good. So if I were to then add to the list of uh, outcome enablement, it's um, delivery, it's leadership, it's metrics, um, and it's basically doing doing what's required to help the team 
yeah. um, achieve its outcomes in the best way possible. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, Niall and Anne, did you have anything else to to add based on your experience there in terms of you know a ways of working COE? What do they do, or what what should they do? Yeah, I think well, in it. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, look, in, in addition to the enablement, I think there's also the, the sort of removal of impediments as well. So, um, you know, being uh, open open to, to hearing the challenges that are happening in the organization so that um, that you can, you know, enable the success, essentially, success um, for the organization. So I think as well as um, sort of that, that sort of support promoting, uh, looking at what's needed in the organization, it's also that... Um, the addressing of, of sort of the things that are stopping stopping that happening um, and being able to to unblock it for the teams essentially and and yeah deliver sounds good now did you want to add something there as well oh I, I only that the devil is in the detail of the words we use here right and mm -hmm. you know we're we're enablers and, and i think we sort of jumped across that pretty quickly and although mm -hmm. we're talking about it but we haven't defined it and I think this is where this topic goes horribly wrong for a lot of teams. They get very mixed up about what they're supposed to be doing and not doing and uh, what everybody's described, Chris included, you know, it, that's enablement work. And, and we need to be clear around what it means to set objectives and achieve things that enable others to get to do their things. Um, and, and I think there's a real tension there, which I know we're going to explore later in the chat tonight. But um, for me, it's grounded in that word enablement, right? How am I helping others be successful and how can I hold my account, myself and my team accountable for doing that? And so I think the tension now that you're talking about, uh, because I wanted to go there next, uh, and Chris, you know, touched a little bit on it uh, from a deliver, helping teams in their delivery. You're talking about it um, as well. But there is this tension that I think is created that um, Sometimes when uh, coaches are on the outside or perceived to be on the outside, how might they enable versus being actually in the teams or working with teams uh, and having skin in the game to deliver and have accountability of those outcomes, D depending on how you're set up, that tension can be either very real or can be, you know, more subtle. Um, so in terms of then how might we then uh, think about the setup and the organization of coaches and a ways of working, you know, COE or COP or however you might think about it. I think there is something to the COE construct here. Um, do you have any thoughts, Anne? Because you've been both on the outside, uh, on the outside, you know, very much enabling in, but and then also on the inside trying to enable. What? How might you describe that tension, and what might we do to 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 resolve it? Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um... Coming from the outside in has um, a lot of, um, it helps you sort of do things a little bit quicker in some ways um, in terms of um, being there for a limited time. So I'm thinking of being a consultant, for example, um, going in, being quite clear on what it is either that we can help enable um, or understanding and understanding um, what the organization needs from us as well. So I think, um, an example of, of that was um, uh, one of the large financial institutions um, uh, that I worked at as a consultant had a COE. They were set up as an internal um, COE, so a lot of people from the business, uh, and um, they were doing great things. They had great intent. Um, they had good vision for the organization and where it was going, but the sort of enablement part stopped with them, so they were very busy. Um, which is another elephant in the room in terms of being careful that you're not, you know, doing doing work with yourself or yourselves um, in the COE, but um, uh, being quite quite mindful about how that um, those great ideas and that vision then is translating into actual practice. Um, so so that was that was a kind of good example of going in, um, understanding what the COE were looking for. Um, and then translating that to the teams and being able to um, bring it to life essentially. And then, and then the trick is obviously keeping it going right in terms of, of bringing it to life. Um, there were internal coaches there as well. Um, uh, they tended to be a little bit lost in the sort of business um, and may have also not come from an agility background. So um, 
they they were um, doing great things, um, but it was uh, it was I think it was just helpful um, from that perspective to come in from the outside in um, and sort of provide that different viewpoint. Um, it doesn't mean though that coaches inside organisations can't do that. I think that I've seen that done really well as well. Um, so uh, I've seen internal coaches um, consult really well, and I think that's that's the same skill set. Um, and often you'll find that those coaches come from that background. So um, sort of having that consulting mindset around being able to understand the problems and then, um, you know, help with those with those solutions. So um, always attention in terms of, you know, who are you and why are you in my organization? Um, uh, but then I think it just comes down to everything. Uh, it just comes down to trust, right? And building those relationships, understanding what, um, you know, that the organization needs and, and helping with that. Yeah, nice one. And what I like uh, about what that's totally spot on is not creating work um, and being too internally focused, because I think yeah. we, because we are enablers, we can be quite good at uh, creating work for ourselves that may or may not um, have have value. So the, the more that we can connect that to the actual outcomes that uh, the the teams that we're working with are trying to achieve, the, the better. Um, and this um it, it's almost like if, if we think of how we're set up or how we're meant to show up <laughs> or, or what the problem is that we're solving then that can guide us a little bit further do we do we put our um, more consultant hat on or do we put the coach more the coach hat on there's um there was actually an article in forbes uh that was uh published a couple of years ago that in 2018 that basically said that um, if you're not specific about what uh, problem you've got and what you're asking for, either it's a consultant or a coach, then it doesn't work. And so the way that they've defined it is a consultant is someone who comes with um, expertise that you're that that you need but don't have that they're able to di quickly diagnose a problem and provide you uh, recommendations, provide you options. Uh, they're at the master effectively of providing advice and they very much focus on the problem, whereas a consultant, uh, sorry, whereas a coach, uh, they are uh, there to basically help you uh, as an individual to be a great leader. They're a facilitator, more a guide. They're a good listener. They're about, you know, teaching you to uh, fish rather than fishing for you. And, and it's all about um, the orientation is all around the outcomes uh, that that you've got. And so what's interesting I find about that, uh, you know, um, that perspective being put forward that you have to choose whether or not you're a consultant or a coach is I actually find that it's much more fluid than that. It's sometimes in the same team, I'm either a consultant or a coach, and it really all depends. So Niall, did you have any thoughts on, on that or just in terms of um, how how might we uh, best um, the role that that we need to play and how we best do that to, to navigate and to be able to provide the right yeah. outcomes. Yeah, well, uh, agile coaches don't have the luxury of saying they're a coach or a consultant. We, we 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 always have an agenda, and that is, as Chris said, we're aligned to getting something done for the organisation. There'll be some objectives at the top level that we're there. To, to make happen, whereas a pure professional coach comes in agendaless and brings a practice and creates the space for the person to, to, to work, work through their challenges and, and, and self-actualize or improve their consciousness, whatever it is, right? And, and, and so we need to take the skill of coaching, apply it to agile coaching, and then thinking with a consultant's mindset around the problem we're here to solve, mm -hmm. some of it's stuff, some of it's process stuff, but we certainly don't have the luxury of of choosing one or the other, we, we certainly have to be both. And I think that's why this, 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 this talk tonight is so useful because we're always feeling a little bit caught in that tension and we have to navigate it. And that's why the role is a super important work, knowledge worker role. Um, and it's why I think Better Value, Sooner, Safer, Happier, not to plug it for a moment, but it was, <laughs> it was really useful in terms of us thinking about those top line OKRs that we're there to enable. Um, and then we bring consulting, coaching, advising, or whatever we have to, um, as Chris was saying, from, from Lisa Atkins' work, we bring what we have to to get the job done, to enable the job to be done. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. So I think the advice there, uh, Niall, is 
is a little bit we need to get over ourselves uh and it's we we turn up and show up however it is we need to get to those uh to get to those outcomes um, I, I think so yeah. and, and originally you said skin in the game and this is an interesting statement right everybody everybody sort of says oh coaches need to have skin in the game <laughs> Well, we can't do your job for you. You need to change your business. We will enable you and support you and help you and do everything and give you everything you need. Remove all your impediments. But at some point, you need to change your business. We only enable that. And um, so sometimes this idea of, well, where's our skin in the game is just an excuse for people not owning the change, owning the bit that they need to do um, to, to improve the way of working and reduce time to value or whatever they're, they're going for. Anyway, that's sort of my hobby horse that I get on occasionally. But And so, Chris, what value then do you think uh, coaches bring then? Um, yeah, can, can you articulate that or give some examples of maybe coaching outcomes um, that, that you've, that you've you know, solved for, tackled yourself? Yeah, that's a very broad question. That's going to have a very broad answer. So it depends on context, right? And so, um, uh, you know, if the outcome is, for example, to help with delivery predictability, then the, uh, um, which is something we've worked on in one of my coaching teams, then we bring a lens of having experience or a mindset of agility in solving that problem versus using traditional means of doing that. Um, and I think one of the benefits of an agile coach, it brings a different perspective of things. Um, because, you know, you can't solve, you know, yesterday's problems with the same thinking as yesterday. That, so to move forward, we need a different um, approach. Um, the other aspect of uh, coaches is that using the, you used the analogy of the ski instructor. I know it's in the book. I used often the um, analogy of um, going to the gym with a um, weight trainer, for example. We're not going to do the heavy lifting for you. We're going to be there every step of the way to help you get better, but we're going to actually, in the end, we're not going to be the ones getting the benefit of it without you changing your ways and developing the habits or whatever you're trying to improve. You have to lift the weights to get the benefits. Um, as coaches, you kind of mentioned before, the uh, power of listening, um, deep inquiry. So this is coming more from a, a coaching perspective. Um, listening, trying to understand, we're tapping into a lot of empathy, compassion. We often talk about meeting people where they're at. And so we need to see and understand what people are experiencing. And it's very easy to say, they don't get it. Well, why don't they get it? Why are they not seeing? What are we seeing that they don't see? And so that inquiry to unpack a little. You know, I use the analogy of a, a fish in water. A fish swimming in water doesn't know it's in water until it jumps out of it. To that a fish, water is just part of them. And so they see that objective, subjective shift. And so as coaches, we bring a lens of um, questioning, inquiry, positivity, because they can solve the problem uh, to I guess the change and I think Niall talked about you know bring different aspects of um, coaching I, I use um, dancing we're often doing a dance with our teams a dance with our um, counterparts in terms of um, they go this way we go this way and we together create that opportunity of change I really like the dancing analogy and I think what you're drawing out Chris is uh, because of the um, the inquiry meeting um, meeting people where they're at, I think sometimes as a res uh, uh, because of the need to do that, which is absolutely the right thing to do, it can take it can feel sometimes as a coach it takes us a long time to to, to get to where uh, we'd we'd like to get to. So, and I'm curious. How do you, as a coach, what, what do you do to help with that frustration uh, that, that inevitably, inevitably might uh, uh, be created or the um, trying to, you know, take the next right step type type thing? How, how do you manage through that? I think I think you uh, don't stop believing. There's a song in there somewhere, right? Um, I think it's important to uh, keep focused on um the outcomes that you're heading towards. I think where you're an experienced coach, um, having that experience uh, and you know the, the stories behind you in terms of um, successes and and failures as well, um, 
it, it really does help because you know what good can look like, you know where you can head. Um, and I think sometimes, uh, well, all the time, you need a lot of patience um, to, to, to get where you need to get. So it, yeah, I think that it's an occupational hazard um, of coaching that it can be incredibly frustrating um, because uh, you feel like you're coming from the future sometimes, right? It's like, I'm from the future. Um, this is what it could look like. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, obviously people are like, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about you and, and the things that you're talking about, but I, I think it's just, um, you know, help, helping people with the business challenges that they have, um, helping them to be successful, helping each other to be successful, right. Is, um, you know, let's, let's make each other look good and, and work together, um, and collaborate well. So, um, I think, yeah, the short answer is patience, um, and, and understanding, you know, that, that, it, that it can happen and that it just takes time. And so just Mark, uh, Mark Payne, heads up, I'm coming to you uh, as the voice of the audience uh, next, but I can see in the chat that there's an eagerness to talk about metrics. And I think that might actually be a nice segue from Anne, what you were talking about in terms of patience. So sometimes I think patience, we can have more patience if we can see uh, some, some leading and uh, lagging uh, measures or indicators along the journey as to whether or not we're, we're making an outcome or having an impact or not. So now, did you have any thoughts on uh, the metrics or what good ones to, to hold ourselves uh, to show the outcomes that we're delivering, hold ourselves a little bit to account as coaches too? Uh, what, what do you think on metrics? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one and a mixed bag. So it's a little bit of a lengthy answer, but bear with me. Um, the reason I, I love Better Value, Sooner, Safer, Happier is because it gave us that idea of the business agility metric view of change and it made it a first class citizen and really helped us all grow up from capital A agile to sort of lowercase agility it gave us a common language on around you know what business agility what it means to talk about it and you know have nested OKRs that that matter to the business so so I think they're the lagging indicators of the enablement work we do but to Chris's point we can't be lifting the weights to change the business what we need to do is the things that lead that change. And this is where the conversation gets super interesting. Um, so if you're leading a team of 30, 40, 100 agile coaches, how do you manage the diversity that Chris referred to when he said everyone comes from wherever they come from and they bring their wonderfulness, their own individual superpowers? And this is the work I'm involved in right now and I find it fascinating. And where I've arrived is I do believe out of everything we can do, we need to be very clear about the practices that we bring because I gave a, a conference presentation the other day in, in Europe and I talked about this backpack that agile coaches have to carry around and it's gigantic. It, it has everything from 1990 NXP all the way through to better value, sooner, safer, happier and, you know, <laughs> certified agile leadership and mindfulness, all this stuff, right? But, but we need to be very clear, I think. And as you said, when we're establishing a COE, what are we there to do and how are we serving the business? And, and out of those top line business objectives that Chris mentioned, we then start to line up the practice sets and the sub-services, if you like, for want of a better term, the sub-enablement services we need to provide to affect change. So for example, we talk about delivery predictability. Well, well, we need to have some data, right? So we should need to enable people to have data to make better decisions. How predictable is the system right now? Tell me, tell me the, how predictable it is, right? If we do not have an answer to that, I think it's reasonable an enablement team would support the business to make the system visible, to allow it to see itself. Um, we talk about delivering change into the system. Where are the bottlenecks in the system at the moment? Again, a, a practice, an agile coach who's deployed to do that work should have is value stream mapping. How efficient and where are the bottlenecks? in the current system end to end. So how do, we, how do we enable that? Well, the deliverable for us would be an artifact with data to help people make decisions to improve the system, to enable them to make change in their system. So I think there's a lot of work we need to do and it's the work I've started to do with lots of others is map that practice library to those outcomes and have some tangible way to say, well, can you do that? So you go to a coach, can you do value stream mapping? It doesn't matter if you can't, because we'll find, we'll help you pair coach with someone who can. And then likewise, leadership coaching. How do we assess if someone's, you said 30 something percent of the respondents tonight said they're doing leadership coaching. Well, I've got a very, very simple leading indicator of leadership coaching and anyone who's ever spoken to me about it knows what I'm about to say. 
the very first thing you need to do if you're, if you're trying to affect change in a leader's mindset is after the first meeting is to be invited back to a second meeting. That's your leading indicator, all right? Or if you're not invited back for whatever reason, and again, I'm not saying this, saying that's a bad coach. It's just a simple fact. If you're not there with the sponsor or the leader, feeling like you have some level of rapport and ability to influence, educate, just purely coach them or advise them, then we have to think about that as a gap in the system and a leading indicator not being met. That is leadership level of coverage or engagement in the system of work. So that's sort of how I see it. I think we need to think about those services, think about the people trying to do everything with their giant backpacks and be really honest about the things some of our coaches can do and can't do and support them and help them to grow and learn. Or I think, as you said, at one, of, one, one panel discussion we had, Chris, you know, agile coaching is moving to a team sport as a team sport now. We need to hunt in packs. We need to coach together to ensure that we can cover off the giant sort of list of services that are expected of a high-performing agile coaching team or enablement service. So hopefully that's helpful, Maria. Yeah, thanks, Mal. I think you touched on a couple of things there. One, uh, which Anne mentioned, which is around trust and connection. Um, and that's what you need to build uh, with your team. And then also, how might we, if part of our, uh, if part of the outcomes that we're trying to aspire towards uh, from a coaching perspective is better value, sooner, safer, happier, then uh, how might we then pull out the right toolkit or practice uh, out of the bag that you're talking about to, to then be able to do that effectively? Um, and so, Mark, what uh, what's happening in the in the chat? I see. Um, are there any questions that we should be uh, moving uh, and asking and moving towards? What's the yeah, I think. Uh, yes, yeah, some good stuff coming through the chat now. So, thanks to everyone for for putting some uh, thoughts down on the on, on the chat. I think um, following on from the metrics one, and Niall started to touch on it around uh, leadership and being invited back to the table. There's just a couple of questions here, a theme around. Um, what is the panel's experience in coaching like existing managers and leaders um, and, you know, start it, what you need to do to kind of help them uh, along their journey as opposed to just traditional kind of ways of working coaching that you do with teams. So that's kind of number one. And then tied to that, any success stories that they've seen with some of those leaders that they can kind of talk to. So I'd love to open up that as a question. Thanks, Mark. And I might hand it over to you, Chris, to kick us off with that one. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think with leaders, I think the main thing is about, we talk about relationships. Uh, until you develop a level of trust relationship, uh, you have to be empathetic, um, really see them for the uh, who they are and the challenges they are and they're, and they're human. I talk about humanizing work a lot. And a key part of this is um, understand what their challenges, what they're trying to solve at work. Um, don't need to talk about Agile at all because what would inadvertently happen, um, a lot of my experience is that when you start talk, talking about those challenges and unpacking it, um, it's nothing about Agile at all. However, Agile can help, not always, but can help the, um, with some of the problems um, in terms of a potential way forward. And so if you start connecting with them, help them solve their problems and help them move forward, that's probably the first path of, you know, helping leaders um, um, progress and move forward to change. Um, in terms of um, uh, successes, I think the major successes uh, have come from getting people to see different perspectives. Um, I think that's the biggest, um, uh, I guess, learning I have uh, and the feedback I have that they really value um, having a thinking partner uh, as leaders the most common thing is they don't have time to think they don't have time to um, look at problems and having a connection and you know having a, a you know coaching conversation with them they actually value that time it takes them out of their day-to-day -day grind so to speak gives them space to you know take a i don't know maybe a, a slower pace and help them think through a problem um, I think that's the biggest benefit and they love that because then that gives them energy to move forward and um, um, in their work. Thanks, Chris. I think that's an awesome spot on share because the, the two questions um, that I normally ask is what's what's in your top five, what's in your top five priority list and what's keeping you up at night? Because to help with that relationship and connection, it's help me solve your problems, help me help you. It is that Jerry Maguire moment. 
<laughs> let me help you mm. uh, as, as the uh, as as the first one um yeah absolutely and yeah uh, yeah yeah i was gonna say most of the time they just want someone to listen to and just you know a thinking partner um they're not looking for you to solve their problem they just want an outlet that they don't often get and so I think in those kind of conversations, that's where, and keen on your perspective, but that's where I feel like sometimes you're then flipping sometimes between consultant and coach, even in that hour or half an hour or however long conversation that you're having, because in order to help with that, the, the trust and the connection, it's like, if I can play back to you, what actually is your problem and how you might approach it, or these are your options, what do you think? That's more of a consultant. Uh, approach and then on the other end it's well let me help you to solve it how might you approach it um what what might the next step that you take type, type conversation might be um which is more like a coach so yeah chris any thoughts on that approach yeah i think a part of that is um really be very explicit in terms of the conversation so uh what you know a typical question i often uh, ha um, open the conversation is how can I be of service to you? What would you like to explore? And depending on where the conversation goes, um, I uh, very clearly, you know, I'm going to help you explore the idea. But if they ask you or you feel like there's an opportunity to provide a, a suggestion, be very explicit with it. Um, are you comfortable? Or do you, would you like me to share some experience I have? Uh, be, so be very explicit with it versus just then going blah. And, and spitting it out um, and so that way the dance stay clear on what you're providing or helping them with and and so forth yeah nice one uh, i think i've just learned uh there there is a mass that is a masterful uh skill right there chris and because i'm a probably err on the side of consultant more that is a great coach uh a coach uh, perspective so thank you for sharing that. Um, and did you have any anything to add uh, to that or any success stories that you wanted to share? No, I think I think that was spot on. It's uh, it's going back to that inf inviting over inflicting, isn't it? And, and just understanding, understanding the problem um, and also going to the core of, of what leaders value as well. I think um, that can that can also sometimes shift shift your approach. Um, if it's, you know, that they value your understanding of the business, then, um, you know, you, you kind of need a different coach for that as well. Which then goes back to the value of coaching in teams, because not everyone is, um, we all love and aspire to be unicorns, but mm. <laughs> we, we can only do and be so much. Um, so I think that's spot on. And, and I think Mark, in terms of, sorry, I was just going to say in terms yeah. of success stories, it really, it really does depend on the openness of the leader, obviously, to be coached, right? Um, I think um the, the the most successful partnerships i've had with leaders have been when they've been open um to feedback particularly how did how did i go with something uh, i did this thing um you know what can i do better sort of that sort of reflection as well so um you know i, I think i think that's where that's where you know you get the best results um and yeah sometimes it's just a challenge back to the patient's topic mm, yeah. maria I, I think i think there'd be a lot of people on the call tonight who are maybe sitting in middle coaching roles, maybe they're coaching at the tribe level or something. They're thinking, when will I get my moment to change a leader's mindset? They, they, they sort of think that this is this aspirational thing that somehow happens in a room somewhere when you're sitting with an individual. And I'm sorry to pop that bubble, but it, it's it's generally over us, like this patience thing, this preparedness, this, this poised to act this having done all of that work, deep, deep, deep work, all the way down to right at the coalface with the teams, being across every all the JIRA data, knowing what's going on. And then when you get this moment to influence or nudge or provide or serve or do whatever in and around a person in an executive position who barely gets time to look above the system and have a moment to breathe, when you get that moment to influence, you will do it and you will be recognised for that and then you'll be invited back. For a second conversation so stop please don't think that there's this contracted thing you do where you say oh now we'll do a leadership mindset coaching engagement sure that exists and i'm sure it happens but it's generally the exception it, it's nudges and, and it's this breadth that we bring um, and think then about your individual superpower that the place you operate from that is your brilliance your your amazingness 
And it'll be somewhere close to that is the thing that you can do for the leader, whatever that is. I don't know what it is. Could be, could be data analytics. It could be leadership and the nuances of, of EI. It could be anything in between. So anyway, I just wanted to say that, Maria, because often people get a bit misled on that. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll add to that, uh, Niall. An important part here is self-awareness. So being aware of your thinking and your what you're maybe wanting yourself versus what do they really need. And I think that's often a confusing part there. So you need to be, I guess, um, uh, this is why I find it sometimes draining because you're always thinking about what I'm saying in the moment and where am I leading it versus are they leading it? And you've got to be very conscious of that. Well said, definitely. And it is a tension, which, which maybe the, uh, the question that unlocks that is how can I help? Uh, yeah. Because that's meeting them where they're at. That's, uh, that's an invitation that's um, not presupposing anything. And that then gives you a chance once you hear the response, a chance to then uh, leverage on your superpower in that context to then help them solve for whatever it is that they've asked you to help. Um, so it's, yeah, a great one to, to get going with. All right, Mark, I'm going to go, I'm going to turn it back to you, uh, voice of the people, any other, uh, questions or threads in there that we want to pick up? Uh, yeah, there's one, um, and I'm working quite closely with Evan at Suncorp and he's put a question in the chat. So I would like to represent Evan. And it's, it's a great question. It's a bit of a follow on from the, the last one we were talking about, which is um, one of the challenges in setting up an enabling team is um, how do you balance the enabling versus doing? So how do you get that right? So hearing from the panel's experience, but also if you don't get it right, or if you do get it right, how do you justify the value of the team ongoing? Because if you don't quite get it right, then you can kind of seen as a, a potentially expensive resource. So yeah, just interested in the panel's views around um, around that. Who wants to tackle that one first? I, I, I can I can tell the story. <laughs> I'll, I'll anonymize it to you know protect the innocent. Uh, I, I I arrived at a client once and I immediately spotted the dysfunction at the enterprise level, and I figured that out. I don't know in three days, but then. It took, me, it took me a year of building credibility in the business to be able to do something about that. Um, so how did you build credibility? By just knuckling down and helping where you needed. So, you know, doing a lot of doing. Um, and then uh, to Chris's point, you're, you're always navigating. Am, am I making them dependent on what I'm doing here or am I teaching them how to fish? Uh, so I think, I think a, a senior enterprise, especially agile coach, is thinking of layers within layers all the time. So if I go down and I execute um, a shining example of how to mobilize a team that is high profile for certain executives, they're going to love me doing that because they want to have a success story. I also build a reputation as a person who goes out and gets stuff done and does things. And then when I do bump into that person in the lift, and I suggest that we maybe look at some data that I've got from across the enterprise around a strategic impediment, maybe then they'll listen to me. And, you know, in the story I started with, that, that is what happened. Over the course of the 12 months, we managed to take a value stream map to an executive team to make a very strategic decision about how they're going to change the way they look at the end-to-end the, the -end system of work. But it was only done through building credibility over a long period of time by rolling our sleeves up. But maybe I'll throw the question back to Maria and the team here. What happens when the central funding runs out and the business has to pay for the enablement services? That 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 that's the, that's really the question we haven't asked here. That's the key. That's the key metric, isn't it, of success? It is. When you have to pay for it, it better be good, right? Exactly. Well, so anyone want to tackle that one before I throw my two cents in? No, go for it. You've got your two cents, go. Well, so I think this is where um, if we've done the, the quote unquote right things on listening, helping, enabling and delivering value. Um, and so we've got trust, connection and outcomes. 
then I don't think that question comes, right? So I think it's about not even having the question there. If the question is there, then something's not quite right would be my suggestion. Either there's, um, it's not clear what the role is. It's not clear what the value or the outcomes are. It's maybe not clear on what the, or maybe there's a different way to approach uh, the role and in, in how uh, the coach works with the teams or the accountabilities. Um, that that would be my that would be my suggestion. Um, so if you get to the get to the point where you're questioning the value, then or the investment, which means that you're questioning the value, then there's probably something not quite right. There's also an element of um, like a host talk about perspectives, and so what is your belief and perspectives, and what you're measuring uh, as a person. So. Um, if you're always a person who's looking at value, you'll get value. If you're a person that's going to look at cost, you'll get costs. So it may not be the, the actual work or the change that's happening. It could be just the perspective. Again, meeting the people where they're at, which can be frustrating having been you know, in those situations. But uh, you've got to see you know, as them, not at them in this scenario. And so empathy is... Um, um, yeah, another key factor again. Yeah, spot on, Chris. And maybe just one other thing to add is um, maybe there's a bit of a, um, maybe in terms of how the, the coaching structures are set up, maybe there's, uh, maybe it's, it's too many. Uh, so if we were actually to focus our attention um, on certain problems um, and work together in hunters packs, maybe that's a better way to organize rather than having, you know, lots of, uh, lots of volume. I don't know if that's controversial, um, but, but prioritizing the, the, the capability and the skills and the outcomes that you've got to the place that needs it rather than having, you know, a um, hundred or so coaches, uh, which might not be, you know, fit for fit for purpose or fit for size for the site. I don't think, for the I think it's controversial. Oh. I don't think it's controversial. I I, 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 I I talk about focus areas. Like, what are we focusing on here, right? And and then if you know the outcome and you link it to say some of the better value metrics on the other side, right? Then this stuff's paying for itself. It's when we decouple what we do and we get stuck in that activity you know enabling ourselves to think wonderful things inside our coe that <laughs> that's when we lost our way right so it's that can that's why as i said the, the, the better value framework is amazing because it allows us to to you know have a straight line between those outcomes that the business should care about because it's in their strategy and their plan and the things we do as enablement specialists so it's up to us i think to make those connections and communicate them and at its core, vision vision is also incredibly important, right? Remembering why we're doing what we're doing. So, why why where are we going as an organisation? Why why do we want to be be agile? Um, you know, and what are, what are the outcomes we're looking for there? What are the audacious things we want to do to succeed in the market that we're in? Mm, I definitely agree with that. And um, vision, purpose, uh, communication. Um, if it's not communicated often, it, it does drop off. I haven't had yeah. some experiences around that. Uh, and it really comes, you know, the aspect I'm thinking of um, comes to mind is Deming's 14 point. It's everyone's job to improve and transform. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, a set of coaches or COE yeah. job to do it. Everyone, you know, all the way from top to the bottom, left and right, it's everyone. And I think that's the probably the biggest challenge. Everyone's so busy working on getting work done that we get to actually how do we improve the system as not just coaches as everyone yeah and so i think there until we can all unlock the incentive uh the incentives that we all have to improve the system i think we're going to keep butting up against that one so it feels like that that's one for us um to, to be tackling all right so we've got five minutes left thank you evan i hope that answered your question uh, to, to some level of, uh, of, of robustness. Um, so my last question for everyone is, and I'm going to ask it of each of you, it's what's the one, uh, and let's maybe just do one, uh, what one learning uh, that, that you've got uh, from, a, from a coaching perspective uh, and, and ways of working uh, center of enablement? What, what's the one learning that you've got? And, and so that then therefore becomes then your uh, your tip if you were to start this uh, start a new a new 
a new coaching uh, gig uh, or a new ways of working center enablement, what would be the, the tip that you would leave? So what's the one learning, which then translates to the tip to get started in the next time? Who wants to go first? Uh, go first. I'll go first. I'll go first. Uh, my one learning is start at the organizational objectives. Once you understand the organization, what is the business strategy to achieve that? Then the um, then the COE, whatever you want to call it, um, objectives follow from that, and the coaching objectives um, follows from that. So, um, yeah, start with the business. The COE is a, it's a probably a tail end. Start with the business. What's the organisational objectives? How are you going to deliver that? Coaching will follow. Okay, good one. Thanks, Chris. And did you want to go next? Yeah, look, for me, I think it's um, capability, having the right people that understand um, what, what you need to get done, who have experience um, in it. I think, um, you know, having that talent density to, to shift the dial and, and get things done um, so that you can you can change change the culture fundamentally first or last, depending on your view. Or all the time. Or all the time. Nice one. Thank you, Anne. And Niall, what about you? I'm going to take the easy way out and link what Chris said to what Anne said. That's the secret. So if we have that, that top line nest and nested objectives that the business wants, we then need to have a really honest conversation with ourselves around what our capability actually is to do the right enablement activities to affect change and have impact. That is an honest conversation because we can't do everything. We have to hunt in packs, as you said. So I'd connect those two and together I think you've got a good solid setting. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you to the three of you for joining me in this conversation. I honestly feel like we could probably talk for another hour at least. <laughs> There's so many things that I wanted to explore more that I just didn't touch because I knew we weren't going to have time. <laughs> so maybe we'll have to do a, a part two, a part two of this. Um, but I wanted to thank everyone for joining uh, today um, and for the chat. I haven't looked at it all, but it looks like there's been some great chatter. Um, so just before we wrap up, uh, I did want to say uh, we thank you for uh, thank you for today. The next uh, meetup that we have is on the um, 15th of November, and it is a special edition meetup where we will have the authors of Sooner Safer Happier. Come join us to talk about the patterns of the book. If you don't have a copy, let me know. Uh, and uh, the key things that, that they've learned and, and that's changed kind of since uh, writing the book. Um, so please sign up uh, if you're interested in that uh, for that one. And then we've got our regular monthly uh, edition coming up on Agility at Spotify and Insiders edition at the end of November. Um, so lots of things to connect in with. Um, before I let everyone go, there will be a very fast Zoom survey that is sent out to you. And because we have uh, grown, we've basically doubled this community uh, in the last three to four months. It's really important that we be guided by what is it that you want to hear? Did you like it? Did you not? Did you learn? What? How might you want to engage moving forward? Um, so please do fill that out because it's feedback that I do look at and that we do talk about as a community leadership team. So please, uh, so please do that. Um, and that is all. So uh, right on uh, six o'clock. Thanks, everyone, and have a good rest of your evening. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks for hosting, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.